Hi there. So doing something unprecedented, I'd say. It's it's evening of Tuesday the 14th, and I'm working on the lecture for Wednesday the 15th. So that's that's pretty crazy, getting ahead and all that. Um, and yeah, I've been going on school stuff for like 12 hours today. So that's that's been a little bit of a grind, um, and, and that's been kind of rough, but I am looking forward in the morning to not having to rush and, and finish my lectures. So yay for that. Um, now today we're gonna, now we're gonna talk about chapter six and seven in 1984. And I'm going to ask you about just I'm going to ask just one question on the homework, um, and that that's to make an argument for what you think is the most important thing in these two chapters, and that's it. Now I don't want you just pulling something out of the blue. I want you to build off what I'm going to talk about about here in this short lecture. Now I'm going to try to be less detailed and leave leave kind of finding support from the text up to you on this, and I'm just going to lay out lay out kind of the general lay of the land and, and the, the principles. So chapter six um, was was mainly about sex, which I don't want to go into too exhaustively here. Um, Winston recalls his marriage, which was loveless and didn't end well or ended in separation. Um, and also an escapade he had some years um, some years before the present. And all I'd say is this, because there is something very significant about chapter six, is that with, um, say, with human sexuality, especially within marriage, because that's what most people end up doing with their lives, is, is finding a partner and getting married, um, you, can, you can screw it up in, in two equal and opposite ways. So this is kind of, an Aristotelian view of, of the virtue of virtues surrounding um, human sexuality, but the the virtue is is the mean. So you have chastity and like go with the church. Chastity is the the proper use of our our uh, sexuality. And when you're married, part of chastity is using that using that gift and then abstaining when it's um, necessary to abstain. So you can you can screw the virtue of chastity up by excess. So something like lustfulness. Um, and you can also go the other way. And this is what we see in 1984 in Oceana. Oceana. Um, so that would be something like, like a defect of the virtue of chastity would be something like in, insensitivity. I don't, that's not technically it, what it is, I'm sure, but something like that. So like just imagine it husband and wife never never um consummate their marriage physically or or do so very seldom and it, it's cold like winston's marriage that's not a good thing for for husband and wife and and um for the kids so so that like the abstaining thing is not not always a virtue it depends on your station in life right if you're not married then, then obviously abstinence is the virtue, but but we're talking about within marriage here. So um, the party tries to basically make sex only a painful, unpleasant duty for procreation, um, and they have that youth chastity league thing, and and they basically they especially go after the women, Winston says, and make them like sexless. Um, and it does funny things to the men. Um, I think, again, I said, I don't want to psychologize the book too much, but what happens when you, in a married man like Winston, seriously repress that, that desire, or that, that side of him, it, it goes underground and then comes up in, in, um, violent ways. And remember early in the book, his fantasy about the dark haired woman or his dream or something, I forget what it was. Um, so that's, that's not such a good thing. Um, and it makes, it makes the men very resentful. And he, Winston views, if he could have an affair, he would view it as like a genuine one, right? Not prostitution. Like he's telling us about, he would view it as like a, a serious act of rebellion and something to be, to be very proud of. Um, but he can't, but he can't. And so that's, uh, 
that's that. Now with the with the proletarians, the proles, it's a little different. Um, they kind of let them practice casual immorality. So it's only the party members who are seriously repressed. Um, and then there's there's also this proliferation of uh, pornography, Winston tells us, and and that's a creepy thing about this book. If you know anything about our our day and age and that pan pandemic which is worse than the coronavirus pandemic believe me um disturbing to think that he's he's using pornography as a as a tool of the totalitarian regime in 1984 and we're seeing it just ubiquitous today so that's that so chapter six there's there's that stuff going on um now chapter seven had some some interesting things and um, we were talking about the proletarians well the chapter starts with with Winston's thoughts about them he says they're the, they're the hope they're they're our only hope because there's so many of them they're like 85 percent of the population um, and he recounts a story of you know hearing what sounded like maybe a rebellion several hundred women all screaming in, in rage and and all that but it turned out they were just squabbling over cheap tin pans in the marketplace and that's the problem with the proletariat they have the power and they have the numbers to overthrow the government overthrow the party easy but they're not organized um they're not organized and by the way that's that's a marxist principle right that's that's what the uh, that's what marx said about the proletariat in in communist thought is that like they have the power to overthrow the capitalist class they're just not organized and they need revolutionary leaders to kind of get them going and spur on the revolution and then once once you set it in motion then it just happens so so that's interesting um winston makes quite a nice remark about the disorganized state of the proletariat until they became conscious they will never rebel and until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. So they're, they're, they're like animals. They're unconscious until they rebel, or they, they will never rebel while they're unconscious like animals. Until they rebel, they're gonna be unconscious. So it's like a catch-22. Um, and now part of what keeps them in that unconscious state is the manipulation of, of information and media. Um, and, and Winston says they basically, you know, they go to work young, 12 years old, get married at 20 or something, have a brief sort of passionate epoch in their life. They're middle-aged by 30, they work themselves to the bone and then they die when they're 60 and that's it. And, and in that harsh of a life, they sort of look forward to their, their kind of vulgar comforts. So sports, entertainment, uh, drinking, petty squabbles about, about uh, material things, right? They're not, they're not thinking about principles like, like revolution or freedom or anything like that. Um, and so they're stuck. And so they're stuck. Now, on the idea of manipulating information because winston has in hand a, a children's textbook from the party and it talks about these three um members of the original guard of revolutionaries so let's, let's hear about them these are the men named jones aronson and rutherford so they were part of the original the original revolutionaries right and eventually they were all ousted and executed and Winston says only big brother was left and that's precisely exactly what happened in the Soviet Union so it was Lenin in the early 20th century who was the ringleader for the Bolsheviks but he had a whole circle of old guard revolutionaries with them um, names like like Leon Trotsky comes to mind and and um, and others and and Stalin was Lenin's henchman now they they overthrew the czarist government and stalin was in power in the early early days of the soviet union when stalin died or pardon me not stalin lenin lenin 
Um, when Lenin died, Stalin, his henchman, right-hand man, he rose to power and kicked everyone else out. All the original revolutionaries, one by one, Stalin painted them as enemies of the people, traitors in some sense, and had them rounded up and killed or exiled, mostly killed, and they were all gone till it was only Stalin. And, um, and that's exactly what Orwell's putting into his book. Now, and he, he talks about the, first of all, the sensational public trial of these three men. Remember Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford, they're arrested, they disappear for like a year, no one knows what happens. Then all of a sudden they're out in a public trial and they do something interesting. They all confess to being traitors and confess to causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people and, and confess to murdering fellow party members and all that. And what happens is then the party kind of lets them off the hook. So, so it seems for confessing, but that's only for a year or two. And Winston sees these men in that, um, in that cafe, what's it called? The chestnut tree. He sees them sitting there um, and he's struck by their kind of aura of old grandeur, or they, he says they still have something about the revolution clinging to them, um, but they're defeated. And they know like everyone who's taken in by big brother and then forced to confess, Winston knows they're going to be dead very soon, very, very soon. And then they're, they're rearrested. They're rearrested and they confess again and they confess to additional crimes. And, um, and then they're, then they're gone. Then they're executed. And again, Solzhenitsyn recounts things like this, many things like this happening in the Soviet Union because one of the things you'll notice in 1984 is no one knows what happened, right? Because right? they're constantly rewriting history, which is Winston's job. Um, so there's no way to be sure about what's true and what's false. Same problem in the Soviet Union. Um, one of the monumental achievements of the, the Gulag Archipelago is just simply historical documentation of all, all these data points in the, in the Soviet Union over decades that are impossible to find. Um, and that's that's part of the monumental power of that book. And again, I'll, I'll find you passages on these um, mock trials. Um, okay, you might ask yourself, though, with these these grand old revolutionaries, why would they confess? Why would they confess to being enemies of the people and everything um, if they know that's a lie? Because what does Winston find out? He finds a newspaper clipping by by accident that shows a picture of those three men with a date on the picture. And they're at some party function in New York and in their confessions, both times during the trials, these men had confessed to being in Eurasia on that date doing traitorous things. So Winston concludes that the confessions are false. They have to be logically. Um, but then he goes ahead and destroys the newspaper clipping anyhow but he knows they're false confessions. So why would these men confess to something they didn't know and that they knew would, would doom them? Well, I think going on in all this, and here's, I think this is the most important thing from the chapters, sort of these two things tied together. So with the proletarians, look at, look at what, um, what the professed motive for the revolution was to make their lives better. And then the party saying all the time, their lives are better. They're, they're more literate than they've ever been. They don't, um, they're, they're, they're freer. They have more economic um, security, all that. The reality though, is that they're worse than they were before the revolution. And it was, no one's denying that it was bad for them in capitalist society. They were still under the thumb, dirt poor, right? Remember road to Wigan Pier, all that. But the revolutions made it worse, not better, worse, not better. Okay. And they're, they're less free and, and um, more stuck and more animal and slave-like than they ever were. Okay, so keep that on one hand. And then um, let's think about this trial. The alleged motivation for arresting those three men was to destroy the enemies of the state, right? Get rid of traitors, keep the people safe. Now, Look at the lie of their confession, which the government knew about. Um, 
the government knew about, the party knew that, that these men were innocent, not guilty. Winston says it straight out. They're intelligent men though. They were part of the original revolution. They're, they're men of action, men of, men of moments um, and all that, which means they're a threat to Big Brother because he's in power. So they have to be taken out, whatever the cost, innocent or guilty, it doesn't matter. At a certain point, if you're high up in the party and you have some, some skill and intelligence, your, your history, you're not gonna last. So take those two things about the proletariat and these high up party members and their confessions. And let's, let's think of the psychological principle. If you're trying to understand why something happened or why, why someone's doing something or why a state's doing something, and you just can't figure it out, which I would say these are confusing because the alleged motive by the party is so much different than, than the reality. Okay. And, and so at odds with the decisions being made, here's the principle, take a look at the outcome of the course of action and then infer the motivation. So if the proletariat is less free and more under the thumb, and poorer and more miserable and more animal-like and more slave-like than they ever were as a result of the party's policies and actions, infer that the motivation must have been to make the people miserable and keep them under the thumb and not help them. Okay, and then go to the party members. The motivation is to take them out whatever the cost, not to get rid of enemies of the state, not to, not in the interest of national security, you could say. And here's the bind the men were in, because I was trying to figure out why would they confess? Here's what I think. They know they're dead anyways, because they've inferred the motivation of Big Brother here. He just, he's gonna kill them no matter what. If they confess publicly and make a good show of it, they'll be blessed with the mercy of a quick death a rifle shot to the back of the head. Um, if they hold on to their innocence, and again, Solzhenitsyn documents things like this happening, if they hold on to their innocence, their death will be as, as miserable and drawn out and as tortured as humanly possible. And you can look at the, the Soviets to wonder about how effective they were at producing painful agonizing drawn out deaths um that's something we'll talk about more as more in detail as we go along i don't have any quotes right now but but that's that okay so there's the motivation to keep the people miserable and oppressed and to ruthlessly wipe out any potential political competitors and Let's see, that, that might be all I have. I feel like there's one more thing I wanted to say about, mo about motivations. Well, it's, it's left me, so, so that's good enough for today, I guess. But I think that's the most important thing from those two chapters is this, this light it sheds on, on what's going on. Ooh, I, I remember, I remember. Uh, the very end of the chapter, it ends in a peculiar way. Here's page 81, very end of chapter seven. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien and also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two makes four. If that is granted, all else follows. I love that. It's like a weird inversion of notes from underground. Remember the underground man wants to say to hell with two times two is four. What if I like two times two is five? I'm gonna hold on to my freedom to say it doesn't equal four. Here, Winston's like two times two equals four is freedom. And why is he saying that? Um, because the, the real world, the world of facts and actual occurrences and everything is so downplayed by the party that no one knows what's real anymore. Case in point, the, the newspaper reporting of, of events that can just be changed at, a, at the drop of a hat. Um, Two times two is four in that context becomes something comforting because it because it is indisputable. It can't be changed by the party. Although Winston says the way they're heading, that's the logical conclusion. They're gonna say two times two is five and people are gonna swallow it. 
right? Think of the rations. It was decreased by from 30 to 20. Big Brother says the next day, we've increased the rations to 20. Everyone rejoices. So two times two is five. Okay, so that's, um, that's good enough for now. We will talk to you later.